In a time where everybody is trying to reinvent fantasy races, it makes sense that the dwarves of Rockholm are the personification of the dwarven stereotype. Here you find magic-resistant subterranean miners with a penchant for artifice and complex social lives. This remastered video was taking you to the dwarfiest of dwarf settings, Rockholm, where even the beards have beards. Welcome to Mistara. I'm Mr. Welch, and hi-ho, hi-ho. It's off to war we go. Hi-ho. The Dwarves of Rockholm was written in 1988 by the late great Aaron Alston. Clive Caldwell, of course, does the art, and this is the only Mistara cover without a woman on the cover. At least we think so. These are dwarves, after all. Stephen Fabian did the interior art, so any resemblance to Ravenloft is intentional. Seriously, some of the interior art looks like the start of a horror movie. The book is 96 pages, and while it's divided between player and DM section, the books aren't separate yet. Rockholm is one of the oldest nations in Mistara, coming into existence in 1400 BC after the immortal Kagiar created the Rockborn Dwarves, after he had to remove the Kogalor Dwarves to the Hollow World thanks to the radiation from the Great Reign of Fire. He changed the area into what would be Rockholm, and then created the new dwarves to populate it. The dwarves, being happy in their way, just stayed in the region until King Dinwar finds the great cavern that would be the city of Dingar, and crowns himself the first dwarven king. He then disappears on an expedition to the lower caverns, leading to the rise of King Everest I, first of his line. The dwarves spread out below the surface, and the nation comes into its own. Rockholm is located in the northeastern part of the known world, surrounded by multiple nations, including Derekin, Ethengar, Yalarum, Vestland, and Solderfjord. There's two parts to Rockholm, the heavily populated underground and the sparsely populated surface. Every major town in Rockholm has a surface section, but without exception, the dwarves largely live underground. This means the surface towns tend to have a larger population of other races than dwarves, as long as the humans, gnomes, and miscellaneous other races behave themselves and, of course, pay their taxes. Internationally, the dwarves have a large list of friends and enemies, depending on if they stay in their own nation or not. The dwarves maintain good relations with their immediate neighbors, as they pride themselves on their mercantile prowess. Dwarven goods are always in demand, despite their higher prices. Their proud dwarven culture and religious beliefs make them natural allies of Yalarim and Ethengar. Their constant wars with the humanoids, both above and below ground, make them close to the nearby northern reaches. The problem Rockholm has is its annoying habit of claiming every large mineral find is their own. They will swarm an area that discovers a payload of precious metals, ignoring local laws as the dwarves descend to clean the area out. This has led them to open conflict in the Five Shires and Glantry, and is straining relations currently with Irindi because of the increasing presence on that island nation. Dwarves will pursue their love of gold and gems across the continent, resulting in their race spreading out across the planet from Rockholm over the centuries. Dwarven cities in Rockholm tend to look the same because dwarven architecture hasn't changed in centuries. They are creatures of tradition. If a building design is considered optimal, it will be used across the nation. Entire city blocks will be duplicated from city to city. It's actually easy to get around in the towns and settlements of Rockholm because they're laid out identically, with only the individual contents of the buildings changing. A residential block will have the same number of houses in it, the same as a commercial block or even a city park. Everything is built the same, and the blocks are the same dimensions with few exceptions in every city. Rockholm is not a welcoming nation. They love merchants and the gold they bring in, but it's not a tourist attraction by any standards. The underground cities are built to dwarven proportions, and since the dwarves have infravision, are often poorly lit. Taller creatures find the cities claustrophobic, as unlike the Hen of the Shires, dwarves do not make human-sized accommodations for visitors below ground. Food and drink are almost always of dwarven origin, they consider their alcohol superior to other races, and have no need of imports. Visitors to the underground cities often get the feeling that they are unwanted, and in the case of many of the dwarven clans, they are. Rockholm is famous for being self-contained. The nation can grow its own food in large caverns in the form of fungal forests. Multiple rivers run above and below ground, giving the dwarves an unlimited source of water. Entrance into the nation above ground is through narrow passes that are guarded by unassailable fortresses. Over the centuries, the dwarves have had periods of isolationism where they close themselves off completely, depending on the whims of the current king. While the kingdom has been open for several hundred years currently, Rockholm still has a reputation for standoffishness. The dwarves do have a sizable presence above ground despite what other races think. While the vast majority live underground and never see the sky in their long lives, a fraction live as merchants, farmers, and soldiers in the towns and forts that dot the surface. Of special note is the farmers of Clan Weirwarf, who provide the large amounts of food for the nation. While the dwarves can survive on the fungal forests in their caverns, the Weirwarf grow all sorts of grains and raise various livestock that the dwarves prefer for food. While there's little glory in growing crops and raising cattle, it is a vital enough service that it elevated the farmers to clan status. 
The dwarves hold the distinction of being the most technologically advanced nation in the known world. Unlike the fanciful Magitech of Alfacia or Glantry, Rockholm dwarves create practical and industrial strength inventions. Their ability to craft Magitech without wizards is a secret that the dwarven folk guard with their lives. They are loath to part with many of their inventions. It takes a king's ransom to get the dwarves to sell just a single one. Emperor Julian XI turned over a hundred tons of gold to the dwarves to have them modernize his war machines with their finest engineers. Derekin, a few decades ago, spent a full 10% of the nation's yearly GDP for the secret of the printing press, which allowed the nation to standardize its certified letters of credit. This has repaid Derekin several times over with the profit generated since. Most dwarven inventions will never see the eyes of outsiders, or aren't even recognized by those who see them in action. An elaborate set of dams and locks allow multiple rivers to flow from Lakes Clintest and Stahl, providing the cities downstream from the water sources not just fresh water, but hydraulic power as well. Complex ventilation systems pump fresh air into the underground cities and even provide air and cooling to the various residences and businesses. Elevators powered by pneumatic tubings raise and lower entire caravans for trading purposes. To other nations, these inventions would be national treasures, but to the dwarves, they just consider them part of their everyday life. More fantastical invention for the dwarves include an underground train network which transports ore and minerals to, from the mines to the factories. The dwarves also have a fleet of stone ships which can pass through rock like it was water. These are national treasures and only used in emergencies. Other inventions include drilling presses, giant cranes, and rapid-fire war machines that guard the mountain passes. Unlike other nations that employ large amounts of Magitech, Rockholm doesn't create a lot of items for personal convenience. Dwarves have little need for magical dishwashers or washing machines, especially since they can do the work themselves. Labor-saving devices are lost on the workaholic dwarves. Dwarven culture is all about productivity. A dwarf incapable of work isn't considered a real dwarf. Even dwarves that have been crippled by accidents or hobbled by age will find something that they are capable of working on. A punishment unique to dwarves is forced inactivity, a period of time where the dwarf is not allowed to create anything. Other races find this strange, but the dwarves consider it to be one of the more sadistic punishments. Even when dwarves have leisure time, they find ways to be productive. Many dwarves will actually get more work done on their day off than scheduled work days. The reason for this is dwarven social clubs. As they are a highly social race, they find comfort in surrounding themselves with like-minded dwarves. Because of this, the dwarves will get together for any and all possible hobbies. There are numerous clubs formed around subjects like sports, history, songs, or even cooking. They are given overly grandiose names like the Poor Society of Northern Bakers or the Eclectic Conglomerate of Underappreciated Duck Pen Experts. These names are a source of amusement for the dwarves, much to the confusion of visitors who don't understand dwarven humor. Most dwarves will be members of at least three guilds, though they rarely have time for more than six memberships. Some of the groups can grow to be problematic, especially groups targeted to antagonize others. A dwarven group calling themselves the Thorns, or a thorn the size of those pesky elves, are devoted to causing trouble just in Alfheim. They are a source of constant embarrassment to Rockholm, though their antics are never more than just petty vandalism. They will openly mock any elf they can see, but they have been known to try to sneak into Alfheim to make pests of themselves before returning. They have been kicked out of the elven kingdom numerous times, and Rockholm punishes them appropriately but their burning dislike of elves mean that they are always ready for another go at their chosen target. Oddly enough, the rivalry only seems to go one way. The elves don't hold a grudge against the thorns, only punishing them when they are caught. The dwarves are divided into clans based on their birth. Changing clans is possible, but difficult, and typically only happens when a dwarf gets married. The clans determine the profession of each dwarf, though there is a little wiggle room in some cases. The militant clan Torquist is not going to turn away a dwarf who wants to become a cleric, and the farming clan Werewarf welcomes merchants into their ranks to help sell the large amount of food they produce. If a member of a clan is set on changing clans, the clan chiefs will often set up an exchange where two dwarves, each wanting to change their position, are released into their new clan, easing tensions between the dwarves. Clan Boradar is a theocratic clan that goes back 2,000 years to the struggles between the dwarves and the orcs over the rulership of the lands. Originally called the Order of Golden Battle, or Burad Hrodar, in the Dwarven tongue, the clan helped defeat the orcs at a great cost in lives. The few survivors after the victory began to rebuild their numbers, eventually ending up as a powerful family that fully embraced the worship of Kagiar. While the clan is not all clerics, it does possess the largest number of them by far. They are a powerful clan and a strong backer to King Everest. As long as he promotes the worship of Kagiar among the dwarves, they will remain his ally. King Everest is the ruling clan of Rockholm. They claimed the first dwarf to support King Dinwarf at the creation of Rockholm was an Everest. 
From that point, the clan has sat on the throne for longer than all the other clans combined. They have a large number of their clan in governmental positions, though not one of them has earned their position through nepotism. Rockholm is a pure meritocracy. Every Everest in charge of a governmental agency earned the position because of talent rather than a blood relation. The family also has a disproportionate number of artisans in their number, and are strong proponents of keeping the borders open. You can't be diplomats and isolationists at the same time. This is a firm belief of the Everest line of kings, and it hasn't changed in over a thousand years. Clan Herwarf is comprised by dwarves not unified by blood like other clans, but instead by belief. In this case, the belief is isolationism. They want the borders closed and the trade stopped. Dwarves are already self-sufficient, and trade with outsiders invites change into society. And change is not a dwarven trait. The majority aren't angry or bitter. They're still dwarves and follow dwarven traditions. They just believe that Rockholm doesn't need the help of outsiders, and that dealing with the politics of humans is inviting trouble. There are a few members of Herwarf that want immediate change and are willing to depose King Everast to get it. These dwarves are called the Repossessed, and claim to re-establish long-abandoned mines in former Rockholm colonies like the Shires or the Northern Reaches. In reality, they're planning a coup against Everast and using the money gained from the reclaimed mines to hire mercenaries and assassins. Skarad clan is one of the most prestigious clans in all of Rockholm, being comprised largely of engineers and architects. These are the dwarves that design and manufacture the elaborate technological marvels Rockholm produces. They are masters of the art of dwarven artifice, able to create magical devices somehow without arcane magic of their own. They are known to be workaholics, even by the lofty dwarven standards of production. To them, the to-do list is a religious script. The clan has vast political power and is one of the wealthiest clans in the entire nation but they don't use their power or their wealth to gain favor. They know they have the power if needed, and the other clans are very aware of this, so Skarad doesn't need to throw its weight around. Circlist clan are the miners, craftsmen, and smiths of Rockholm. They work the mines, shape the ores, and sell the goods. Every clan needs them to move goods across the nation and beyond, and without the mine, the nations collapse. This gives Circlist both wealth and power, something they don't take advantage of unless pressed. Outside of Rockholm, this is the clan that most people are familiar with, which only increases their prestige. Circlist is the staunchest foe of Herwarf clan, as isolationism would be the ruin of Circlist. Torchrist is one of the oldest clans and represents the military of Rockholm. They date back to the days of King Dinwarf, when their founder acted as one of his generals in the wars against the orcs. While Torchrist does not comprise the entirety of the military, they do occupy most of the positions of leadership within it. The Rockholm army is already formidable. A fortified dwarven army is largely considered unassailable by military strategists. The Torchrist mean to maintain that reputation, and will use any excursion on the surface by humanoids or other hostiles as a reason to mobilize. While Rockholm is surrounded by allies, and the dwarves have no interest in expansion, the Torchrist are always looking for a battle. The clan is utterly loyal to King Everast. Right now, their biggest target is Glantry. Ethengar pays handsomely for dwarven mercenaries, though actual conflict with Glantry is unlikely. Werewolf clan is the poorest and least respected of all the dwarven clans, consisting primarily of farmers. It's telling in Dwarven society that farmers are held in less regard than criminals. While the rest of the nation might not appreciate the efforts of the Weirwarf, they have to grudgingly admit that without them the nation wouldn't be able to feed itself. Weirwarf has more members above ground than any other clan, running the surface farms located deep in the valleys of Rockholm. The Weirwarf have had to prove their power in the past. When Clan Torchris threatened to disband the clan of farmers, they responded by delaying food shipments to the military for a week. Torchrist immediately relented, but never forgave the Werewolf. The other clans are, at best, neutral to Werewolf, who are beneath notice for most of them, which is, frankly, the way the farmers prefer it. Dwarves are known for their slow acceptance of new ideas, and their rampant adaption of them once the idea is assimilated into their culture. They took the concept of writing from the elves reluctantly, but once their written language was finalized, they created mechanical means to reproduce written works quickly. Where elves have libraries filled with numerous scrolls, the dwarves have row upon row of printed books, each one stored in a highly regimented system created by their lore masters and librarians. It takes the dwarves a while to determine if an idea is a good idea, but once they've accepted it, they embrace it without reservations. Oftentimes they will create competing devices to facilitate the advancement, and the best machine will be the one that the dwarves mass produce. The surface of Rockholm is considered a wild and untamed wilderness, with only a few roads leading into the nation. The dwarves don't care as much about their surface territory as their underground areas, so they leave areas outside of the above-ground cities alone. There are humanoids found in Rockholm, but they are a favorite target of the military who will use them to keep their skills sharp, meaning humanoids keep well away from dwarven settlements. 
Most intelligent monsters also stay far away from dwarven towns, lest they be hunted down for target practice. The exception are the mountain giants, who are on quite friendly terms with the dwarves and have long been allies of Rockholm. The mountain giants make their homes near the tops of mountains, and often work for the dwarves as either laborers or mercenaries as the situation needs it. As the giants have no use for the underground cities of the dwarves, and the dwarves don't venture into the peaks, the two races have developed a beneficial symbiotic relationship. Mountain giants are common sights in dwarven armies when they have to go to battle, serving as living battering rams or trebuchets. The dwarves do have a secret to their vast wealth, and that is their use of magical transportation to open up the inner planes for mining. An artifact known as the Planar Drill allows the dwarves to venture briefly into other planes to mine all available metals and gems they can find before returning to Mastara. These operations are usually done under heavy guard, as the denizens of the planes of earth or minerals aren't keen on these sudden strip mining operations. The Planar Drill can also reach the outer planes with great difficulty, or even other worlds like Kren or Orth, though those are usually avoided because the gods of those worlds don't appreciate outsiders stealing their wealth. But since Rockholm believes all metals and gems are theirs, they will take the chance if the profit is high enough. Rockholm does not hate all wizards despite that commonly held reputation. They despise Glantrian wizards, certainly, but a spellcaster walking into Rockholm isn't signing his own death certificate. While the dwarves have no need for arcane magic themselves, and their resistance to it is legendary, they recognize it as a tool. Wizards can find employment among dwarves if their magic can help with one of the numerous projects. These terms of employment are almost always on an individual basis, and the employment is rarely long term. Rockholm has a strong love of clerical magic, while the nation is monotheistic in its worship of Kagiar, they respect other immortals and welcome their clerics. Druids are informally welcomed in Rockholm, as they have no official standing, but as long as they help maintain the wilderness above ground, the dwarves leave them to do their own thing. Bards are embraced by the dwarves, who love to hear tales of old, especially regarding past dwarven battles and achievements. Most bards find the dwarven tastes for entertainment dry, but the large amount of gold the dwarves toss at them help them get over their hesitation. So why do you want to play a Rockholm dwarf? They have reputations for being sticks in the mud. They're pragmatic to a fault and hard to convince at the best of times. Their innate greed can cause a lot of problems when it comes to dividing up the treasure, and their reputation abroad isn't the best. The dwarves do represent the most technologically advanced nation in all of Mastara. They are also highly educated and loyal to a fault. But dwarves will open up to their friends, and they always love a good yarn or a stiff drink. Rockholm dwarves are an acquired taste. They come across as stern and standoffish, but once they've earned someone's friendship, you have a friend for life. Okay, moving on to the next video, we are going a Viking with the Seventh Gazetteer, the Northern Reaches. Get ready for runes, longships, and mead as we take on three nations at once. But until then, remember, nobody tosses a dwarf.